hate everybody. And I enjoy the fight. I see the fight. I enjoy the fight. I see the fight. Okay, I think there is a small delay here. Um, but we're in the seventh day of the Congress, and this is the second webinar of today, and we're going to take a look at the sentiment platform. And sentiment is a on-chain and sentiment data platform. Um, so it's awesome for checking out what everybody thinks of a coin, what's happening on chain. And during the webinar, we also have a giveaway. Um, we'll be giving away exclusive Nest Club, uh, and it's a one month subscription. So if you're looking for, um, for access to the Burp Nest, keep an eye on the screen. We'll be flashing a code you can use in the giveaway. Um, I think that's enough from my side. Uh, let's welcome Dino and Brian from Sentiment. Hey guys, how are you doing? Great to be here. Hello, hello. Awesome, awesome. Um, could you give us a little introduction? Uh, what is Sentiment? Sure. Um... So generally, sort of the elevator pitch, uh, Sentiment is a all-in-one token intelligence platform. Uh, we started uh, or built this project back in 2016. At the time, the idea <clears throat> was pretty much the same as it is today. Um, the fact that cryptocurrencies are still largely evaluated by uh, just a few uh, very sort of limited data points. And uh, it seems like most people try to contextualize market behavior and uh, cryptocurrency events through the prism of price and volume data, which obviously makes sense, but we believe gives an incomplete picture of what's going on with the crypto market on a daily basis. So what we've done in the past four, almost five years, is we've uh, built a platform that provides more information about uh, token specifics. So uh, outside of price and volume related data, really what the sentiment platform is about is it's built around three additional or complementary sources of information to bring more context and uh, insights into daily market behavior. These three sources of information are on-chain data, social activity data, and development activity data. So we have uh, a variety of almost uh, over 100 metrics uh, for more than 2,000 different cryptocurrencies on the platform. We'll be talking about some of them today on this call, but that's sort of the, the general idea. So Sentiment is a token intelligence platform where you can go to get more information about the behavior of different key market stakeholders. So whether that's the crowd, whether that's whales, uh, exchange related flows, uh, long term holders versus swing traders. Uh, we've built this entire platform around the idea that you should be able to look into the behavior of specific market actors and how they can impact the price action of any coin in particular. So, yeah, that's about it. I think that's that's awesome because you, um, as a trader or an investor, you can build a thesis with with that and use that data to support that thesis. Because I think in the past people were just guessing, maybe looking at some Reddit activity, but by combining all the information that is available on the blockchain and in the internet, I think you can build a, a much uh, better better thesis. Um, and there are a few competitors in the market, especially on on-chain, but I think there are a few elements that set sentiment really apart from them. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so obviously I don't think we're the only on-chain data provider on the market. There are a few differences, important differences between us and uh, competitors. First of all, when it comes to on-chain data specifically, I think Sentiment still is one of the most comprehensive on-chain data providers. So a lot of, uh, of our competitors focus heavily on Bitcoin and Ethereum in terms of their on-chain coverage uh, and the metrics that they provide. Uh, we, I think, 
it at most uh, you usually it depends on the competitor but i think we have sort of between 90 and 95 percent similar metrics when it comes to bitcoin and ethereum where we really shine is the coverage of the rest of the crypto market from an on-chain perspective so currently we provide on-chain data for about 1200 different cryptocurrencies and we're token agnostic in that sense so it doesn't matter whether you're talking about bitcoin or a, mar a coin with a market cap of I don't know, $100 million, we provide the same um, sort of fidelity of data, the same breadth and scope of data. Um, and this is where really, I think, Sentiment shines as a platform is allowing you uh, or giving you further clarity into even smaller projects and smaller coins, which I mean, you know, uh, these days, I think a lot of people are more getting more and more interested in alts. So this is from an on-chain perspective, our competitive advantage. And then outside of just on-chain data, like I said, uh, Currently, we are really the only platform that takes social data seriously. Um, none of the other on-chain providers or on-chain aggregators that I know uh, really have a lot of or give a lot of insights into what's been ha what's happening with social sentiment in particular. So let me just give a brief overview of how we calculate social sentiment. Um, we've started tracking social chatter in cryptocurrencies three years ago. So we've built this database of over 1500 different crypto related social media channels. These are channels that are dedicated to cryptocurrencies. These are Telegram groups, crypto subreddits, popular Twitter accounts, professional trader chats, some of them hidden from Google, so on and so forth. So we try to listen in to these conversa conversations anywhere that the main topic of discussions are cryptocurrencies. We try to uh, scrape that data and then, you know, forge and compile actual actionable metrics um, using that uh, that data and currently we collect over a hundred thousand daily messages uh, from cryptocurrency ch related chats um, and we've built between I think five and ten very specific metrics using that data we've back tested some of them and it seems like they do indeed have some very interesting alpha uh, in specific situations and yeah we'll be showing some of them today so this is I think one of the uh, sort of bigger uh, competitive advantages for us is that we're not just an on-chain platform, but we also provide these additional sources of information like social data, then also development activity of projects uh, that we uh, compile or calculate through public GitHub repositories. We also provide data on derivatives um, and other sources of information as well. So it's really sort of an umbrella uh, market intelligence platform that we're trying to develop here. Awesome. I think it's really valuable. You can zoom in into specific coins with these metrics. I see, you know, one of the um, most famous ones for maybe a little bit of sentiment data is the fear and greed index, uh, which people, a lot of people don't really understand or misunderstand because half of that index is price action data. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really good that you, in, on your platform, you can zoom in on that sentiment data and not only about Bitcoin or the market in general, uh, but on a specific coin. Because if you can catch that, you can see maybe where there's that ultimate greed happening and you know where there's like a big influx coming in. Uh, or uh, as you said before, there are some some whales or bigger players that might accumulate some uh, some of these coins, uh, which probably you know are bigger players that might move the market could you could you tell a little bit more about that how can we zoom in uh, on these specific players in the market and how would you do that uh, on sentiment sure so uh, i myself i'm not a massive fan of the fear and greed index simply i mean for the reason that you mentioned i think if you go to the through the methodology of the fear and greed index i think it's relatively rudimentary and it uh, uses a lot of sort of just like i said it mostly relies on price and volume related information uh, which while we're obviously using that information as well to provide context about the markets i don't think it gives a complete picture of what's going on i think um in crypto, uh, there are additional sources of information that are not available in traditional finance. And, uh, you know, we are now sort of now in 2020 and 2021, we're really starting to see on-chain analysis and other types of analysis uh, become mainstream. So as far as how you would sort of zero in on the specific behavior of different stakeholders, 
Um, on sentiment, um, we sort of group metrics by stakeholder. So for example, we've uh, developed a number of metrics that specifically target the behavior of large addresses. Let's say addresses that hold between 100 and 1000 or 1000 to 10,000 BTC. So these very, very large addresses that typically have a disproportionate impact of the market, you can zero in on their behavior over time, whether that's the total amount of Bitcoin that they hold and sort of track the um, holdings of those large co cohorts over time, whether they're in an accumulation mode or whether they're in a redistribution mode, which could point to some lack of confidence uh, by uh, by whales. And then um, that sort of uh, principle is applied to a variety of different stakeholders. For So like I said, you can also track information about the retail sector on sentiment through our social metrics, where you can really see what the main sort of mainstream crypto community is talking about how they're feeling about a specific coin and really what we found over time um and some of some people in chat might not be surprised by that um is that it's usually or, or it can be a good idea to actually bet against what the crowd is thinking um so typically when we see a large uh, sort of elevated values in social metrics suggesting that you know the coin is being um very much in the limelight of the crypto community. The, the community is talking about it more and more. It's becoming increasingly popular. That's typically not a great sign for its short-term price action. Uh, seems to suggest that overall, when uh, the market is hyper aware about a coin's rally, that's usually this time when uh, the coin hits peak market euphoria. And we see a period of either price consolidation or short-term correction. I mean, we've got countless of examples that I can show on the charts where there's these like massive spikes in social volume or the amount of mentions of a coin that are coinciding with, you know, the coin peaking in price as well. And then experience in between like a 10 to 25, 30% decline over the next couple of days. So generally speaking, um, yeah, I mean, on, on the same base, we've sort of tried to group metrics by stakeholders. So you can um, look at, I don't know, specifically the behavior of whales, the behavior of retail crowd, the behavior of anyone interacting with exchange wallets, which I think is very important in these days, sort of tracking the uh, inflows of coins to and from exchanges, tracking the amount of deposit addresses, which could suggest increased sell side pressure. Um, so we're really trying to uh, zero in on different pockets of market behavior and how they can correlate or coincide with what's happening with the coins price action, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense. And I think you tapped into a really good point where this data isn't available in traditional markets and you can actively track the supply and demand where there is these inflows into exchange. So there is supply. And if you can see these actors then acting on exchange, I think we had a good example uh, from that in the last few days where there was, I think, a large inflow flow or a movement from a Bitfinex wallet. And if you... Um, days or hours later then somebody started selling like aggressively on on bitfinex so um in that case there is too much demand and price uh, sorry too much uh, supply and the supply gets dumped and and the price goes down but on the other hand that's also how you can look if there is uh, is demand and you can see these outflows and see if large players have have accumulated so that's that's absolutely awesome um that you can do that with, with a platform uh, like this. Um, I think last question before we, we go to the screen uh, sharing um, is that um, you also have that, um, that, that maybe, maybe we should go to the, to the screen sharing. Um, is it, is it okay? Can we? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm okay. fine with it. Yeah. Already. Okay. Nice. Um, um, how how could we maybe predict with um, the the tools you just mentioned uh, what price movement um, Bitcoin would be doing? Like, what do we look for um, when something is is stopping? Um, maybe yeah. on Bitcoin or maybe on another coin. Yeah, I can take this one, and Dino, maybe you can just uh, start with what uh, we typically plan to begin with when we give an over overlook of uh, exactly what. Uh, on-chain metrics for Bitcoin specifically are most valuable, and that would be daily active addresses. Uh, so what Dino is going to be showing here is our um, hourly, in this case, each candle is worth one hour. Um, the amount of addresses that are circulating on the BTC network at any given time. 
Uh, as we can see, there's been quite a fluctuation and a big uh, kind of movement away from the norm that began in May uh, after that initial price dump where uh, Bitcoin dropped down to uh, as low as below 30K at one point before a quick rebound. Ethereum dropped more than 50%, many other altcoins more than 70%. Um, but there was a distinct lack of address activity when the price dropped, which told us that if and when there was going to be a gradual recovery, it was likely going to be a gradual one because of the fact that we look at May, uh, and I believe we were up above 1.2 uh, million addresses on a given day. And then it took uh, up until about a month ago for us to really start seeing 1 million or more addresses consist consistently. And even though we were able to break an all-time high, what we didn't see was a return back to, you know, that 1.2 and above level uh, million addresses per day, which would give us a boat of confidence, right? So this is what I would call a macro indicator where you're really looking at things from more of a zoomed out perspective because one particular hour or one particular day isn't going to see an immediate effect on the market. But over time, like we saw in this rise um, on the way to the initial April all-time high, um, that would be a, a surefire bullish divergence that would tell us that price is justified to keep on climbing. Whereas conversely, a month later, uh, when the address acti dr activity dropped off a cliff, that would be a sign that uh, we might be in for a bit of a rough ride for a little bit, which we were up until really early August. Yeah, so I mean, these are um, some of the more network level metrics that we're starting with. And I think it's a, a generally a good opener to people that are not maybe familiar too much with how on-chain data works. So like Brian said, really what this metric simply shows is the amount of unique uh, address activity on the Bitcoin blockchain. So how many unique addresses are interacting with BTC? By interacting, I just mean sending or receiving Bitcoin on a daily basis. And typically, uh, based on historical uh, trends and based on previous bull rallies, we seem to see uh, sustained price rallies often go hand in hand with sustained growth in network level activity, which does seem to make sense. It, uh, you know, on chain so, sort of address activity and increasing address activity is often used as an on-chain proxy for token related demand so the more uh, new blood is coming into the market the more new blood is interacting with the coin uh, the more from a fundamental perspective a rally can be justified so we've obviously seen quite a big uh, sort of between a 25 to 30 percent decrease in our daily or sort of intraday on-chain activity on the bitcoin blockchain between may and early june uh sorry early july uh, obviously because of the correction there has been a fairly strong uh decrease in network level activity and also network value creation on a daily basis so this was sort of a period where a lot of people were uh, no longer interacting with the bitcoin blockchain i think a lot of uh, addresses were moving back to dormancy uh, being a little bit spooked by the market action so over the past really two or three months, we have seen the trend once again move into a positive direction. And this is generally, I think, what we like to see uh, from a network level perspective. We do like to see an ongoing rise in the interest and demand for a coin and in daily interaction with the coin, because that all also means um, the appreciation of the value that is being created on the blockchain daily, right? So generally speaking, um, a few... I think it's now a week ago. So when we hit the new all-time high, the amount of addresses interacting with Bitcoin have hit a six-month high. So it was 1.14 million. Let's see if I can, if I zoom in, I'll be able to show you exactly how high we got. 1.19 actually million. So this is a very strong, this, this is, by the way, the all-time highs for Bitcoin's daily active addresses were reached here in the May and April uh, period. So now we are slowly starting to inch back to those levels of daily network activity. Uh, the question I think that we are posed with now is what happens uh, now that the, the price of Bitcoin is starting to experience on some downward volatility. So how does the network react to downward price pressure? In other words, are we going to see uh, network level activity for Bitcoin uh, sort of ignore this price downtrend and continue to move in this upward momentum and, and remain uh, sort of uh, re remain positive and, and remain in an upward momentum? Or is it going to start declining alongside its price action? So if it starts declining, that would sort of be a relatively concerning signal suggesting that the network is 
receding back to dormancy. And generally speaking, that pattern has not done well for a coin's price action. But if the coin's price action or Bitcoin's price action continues to decline or it even consolidates at these levels, um, but network level activity remains high, and even continues to move in the upper uh, direction, that would sort of be a bullish divergence that we would uh, feel fairly, fairly decent about um, and hopeful about simply because it means that uh, regardless of its price action, the network level demand for Bitcoin is increasing. Um, and generally speaking, that can be a, a strong confirmation of the potential for Bitcoin to rally to a new all-time high. Um, so yeah, so so far I think network level metrics are looking nice. They're looking decent. They're they're moving in the right direction. Another sort of network level metric that we like to keep an eye on is uh, token circulation or Bitcoin circulation. So essentially, what we're seeing, what Bitcoin circulation is uh, really doing. Let me just uh, show you. Yeah, just to to change the the lines here what bitcoin circulation does is it calculates the total amount of unique bitcoins or unit of units of bitcoin that are moving on the blockchain daily right so the idea or the premise is similar to daily active addresses the more unique bitcoins are moving on the the blockchain daily the more value is being generated and created on the and transferred on the network and so from a fundamental perspective, that can be a positive sign for network adoption and uh, general sort of uh, sustainability of a price rally. So uh, when we're talking about differences between cryptocurrencies and traditional markets, in traditional markets, you have a PVE ratio, right, which essentially tries to measure the value of a stock based by or when you uh, compare it to earnings per share. Right. So you take the um uh, you take the, the price of the stock uh, divided by earnings per share um, and you sort of get a measure of whether that stock or an asset is overvalued or undervalued. Obviously, when you try to translate that to a decentralized scenario, something like Bitcoin doesn't have a balance sheet. It doesn't have an earnings per share. So what we do instead, uh, what on-chain analysts have done for a couple of years now, is we use this metric, which is token circulation, to as a surrogate for earnings per share. So instead of, uh, essentially what we do is we take the market capitalization of a coin like Bitcoin, and we divide it by the total amount of unique BTC that is moving on the blockchain daily. And so if the market cap is too high relative to the sort of amount of value that is being generated on the network daily, then this ratio, this what we call an NVT ratio, which is a network value to transaction ratio, uh, this ratio would be negative or it would suggest that the, that the market cap is too high or the asset is overvalued. Or on the other hand, if the market cap is too low relative to the amount of value being transferred on the network daily, that could be sort of a bullish divergence and the NVT ratio would be positive or it would be in the green. So currently, um, Brian and I were just uh, looking at this yesterday. The NVT ratio for Bitcoin is flashing green at the moment simply because the market capitalization of Bitcoin has clearly dumped um, or sort of declined. However, the general sort of uh, network wide momentum in terms of circulation and in terms of value creation and accrual on the on the blockchain has continued to move in the positive direction. So now we're sort of still seeing a semi bullish divergence where the price is dumping, but the network level activities are not. So the question now is really going to be what happens in the next seven to 10 days. Um, if we start to consolidate around these levels or even drop lower, um, are network level metrics going to be able to sustain the same momentum that we've seen them uh, sustain over the last couple of months? Or are they going to fall victim to market FUD and we're going to see another sort of decline in network level activity? So based on that, I think from a fundamental perspective, it's going to be, um, you know, th the answer to that is going to really determine whether fundamentally there's a potential for a quick uh, bounce back or if we're going to experience more of a sustained drop in Bitcoin's price action. Obviously, it's not the only metric that we look into, um, but from a network level perspective, these are two or three indicators that we really like to keep an eye on um, to, to sort of gain a sense of where the uh, wholesale sentiment is uh, moving or shifting on a daily basis, right? Yeah. 
the summary with both of these metrics that Dino showed here, circulation and address activity, is the fact that utility is what makes prices generally go up and down. It's not, you know, an individual buy or an individual sell. Some people think, you know, one big sell off means that uh, that's essentially just money being dumped onto exchanges when the reality is there are buyers and sellers at any given time. And when there is a lot of activity, whether it's a, a big buy or a big sell or anything in between, more of it is good. Uh, whether it's addresses increasing over time or just raw tokens circulating on an increased basis over time, this generally has a positive effect on price. Um, and as Dino said, we currently, thanks to the, the nine or so percent correction that we just experienced with Bitcoin temporarily actually still being under 60K at the time of this recording, um, that's allowed even the circulation staying steady it's now considered to be more of a bullish divergence because the circulation hasn't dropped. It's in fact stayed where it was prior to the drop, if not increased a little bit, because there's now more polarization of the coin and people are wondering whether we're about to see a further dump or whether this is time to buy the dip. And that's actually good because it's showing increased interest for Bitcoin overall. And that generally is a net positive effect. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, these are sort of network level metrics. Really, when it comes to when it comes to these types of market corrections that we've experienced over the past forty eight hours, uh, one of the things that we really like to look for are markers of market pain or sort of indicators of market pain, uh, sort of. Uh, signals that the market is really in a pickle, that there's a whole lot of anxiety and FUD. Generally, our founder has sort of, uh, you know, tried to build this entire platform from, from the get-go uh, with the idea that the more uh, pain the market feels, the better it is in the in the sort of mid to, to long term. So I think uh, we have, based on the several indicators, been a little bit too euphoric, a little bit too overexcited about the rally not just for Bitcoin, but for a lot of outs over the last couple of months. So really what we're trying to see now is whether this sent, this sort of bullish sentiment and bullish euphoria is declining uh, and whether we're actually moving to more of a, uh, you know, FUD based economy for the short term. So one of the metrics that I like to look uh, at to sort of give me a sense of that is this one which we call network realized profit loss. So I'll explain briefly what uh, this metric does. Uh, it's not as sort of complicated as it may sound. So essentially what network profit loss does is it tries to visualize the total ROI of all daily transactions on the blockchain. So what that means is for each unit of Bitcoin that moves on the blockchain, we take the price at which it was last moved so let's say that a unit of Bitcoin was last moved here and we assume this was its acquisition price or buy price. And then the next time that it moves on the blockchain, uh, we take this price and we assume that this was its sell price. So the difference between those two prices um, for all daily transactions becomes this metric. And then essentially spikes in natural profit loss point to elevated periods of profit taking because it points to uh, a moment in time where most, on average, uh, most uh, units of Bitcoin moving on the blockchain are moving at a significant profit relative to the last time they moved on the blockchain. And then on the other hand, when we see these sort of declines in network profit loss, this points to a period in time of time where most units of Bitcoin moving on the blockchain are moving at a loss relative to the last time that they moved. So let me zoom in now so I can show you a bit clearly what happened during the correction. So interestingly enough, let's actually zoom to the last three months. There we go. Interestingly enough, we have seen a pretty robust dip in Bitcoin's network profit loss as we actually, uh, alongside the first leg of the correction, and then also today we are seeing uh, more of a, a downward uh, pressure in Bitcoin's network profit loss. So what that really means is that it seems like uh, the network level activity in terms of units of Bitcoin moving on the blockchain is skewed to people moving their bags at a loss. So most on average, most uh, units of BTC moving today and moving um, two days ago when the, the correction started, were moving at a loss compared to the last time that they uh, moved on the blockchain. So just like put that into perspective because we're still at 60K, right? So there aren't or there haven't been that many days, that many weeks that you could have bought Bitcoin at prices higher than it is right now, 
Um, so the fact that even at these, like, yeah, we've, we've had a 9% correction, but we had a 9% correction from an all time high. So the fact remains that we are seeing uh, people or addresses moving their bags at a loss uh, at some of the historical high prices for Bitcoin, suggesting that these are really weak hands that have been uh, responding to the dump more recently. So probably addresses and people that have acquired here and here, basically in the run-up to this correction, are seem to be panicking a little bit. And generally, this is what I like to see. Um, I like to see people panicking uh, and thinking that the end of days is here um, because it points to a... Uh, potentially oversold conditions and in general it points to a lack of uh bullish sentiment and euphoria which typically speaking from my own experience with these metric metrics is not a great place to be so when the mar the market has a uh, clearly established bullish consensus that's usually not a great time to enter into a coin um based on some historical backtest that we've done so we are definitely seeing some sense of panic and a little bit of concern among Bitcoin holders, uh, which seem to be dumping in fears of further downtrends over the last couple of days. Um, obviously, it remains to be seen what happens next, but we have seen sort of similar uh, drops in net profit loss as Bitcoin started to consolidate and stop dumping, really. So we've seen it here in May 1st, and then we've seen it around several local bottoms as well. Um, periods in time where uh, the weak hands have capitulated, uh, allowing sort of uh, redistribution to more sort of diamond hands and, you know, people that are uh, convinced in Bitcoin's long term potential and fundamentals. And uh, this type of redistribution, I think, is important and even necessary for us to have another leg up. So, so far, I mean, I would keep an eye on this chart, um, especially I mean, I see people talk about uh, 52k being sort of the next uh, support level. If this happens, I would not be surprised to see net profit loss really reach some historical lows. Um, and then as we see sort of more and more weak hands of moving out of the market and capitulating, I think that's a stronger sign that we might be approaching a local bottom for, for BTC. So these are type, sort of uh, metrics that I, I like to keep an eye on as far as network level activity is concerned. Now, I can go into a few more metrics unless uh, you guys have specific sort of questions or specific directions at which you would want to take this. Yeah, I, I think I have one question because there are people selling at a loss. But as you said, there is always somebody on the other side of the trade. So yeah. somebody is buying. And the first metric that comes to my mind is can we see that on chain or can we see that on the outflows of exchanges at these levels? Are, right. Is there some accumulation going on? Uh, which metrics would you use for for this question? Yeah, so there's a few metrics that I would uh, I would use there. So actually, this is uh, obviously um, it's more difficult as far as on chain data is concerned. It's more difficult to spot accumulation than sell side pressure. Because for example, when you look at exchange related metrics, like right, when you see a spike in Bitcoin's exchange inflow or the amount of Bitcoin moving to exchanges, there's usually uh, only one reason why you would move Bitcoin to exchange and that's probably to sell. Uh, when you see withdrawals of Bitcoin from exchanges, that could point to a, a, a wide number or a wider rate of things. It could point to arbitrage, it could point to um, rebalancing, it could also point to people moving to, um, you know, other use cases, maybe DeFi. Uh, it, it could, uh, it's not as simple as figuring out it's sort of withdrawals, meaning accumulation or buy pressure. I actually like to use another sort of uh, complementary metric to figure out whether there's potential buy side pressure. But first of all, as far as exchange related data is concerned, let me just show you. So as far as exchange, this is the net flow uh, for Bitcoin. And I'll, I'll zoom in a bit. Last month. There we go. So this is the net flow for Bitcoin. Uh, uh, so basically the total amount of Bitcoin moving to versus total amount of Bitcoin moving out of exchanges. And as you can see, yes, we are sort of experiencing more of Bitcoin being withdrawn from exchanges recently uh, than uh, moving to exchanges, which could potentially be a positive sign and actually suggest that, uh, you know, people are uh, acquiring B BTC on exchanges and then withdrawing it to their cold storage, to their hardware wallets or whatever uh, for sort of long term um uh, uh, long-term storage right well, now so, what so you can see mm -hmm. that because of the divergence right so let, let's talk our our viewers into this because we see um the first dip 
uh, in uh, the exchange flow balance was much lower than the ones we see now. And uh, while price is basically flat, is that why you think it's, you know, it points a little bit to that accumulation? Here? Yeah, I think it's also just even without, uh, just based on, uh, so, so essentially when you see this zero level here, right? So this level would basically mean that on a daily basis, uh, there's about as many Bitcoin moving to exchanges than from exchanges, right? So when we go higher, these levels point to periods in time where more Bitcoin is moving to exchanges than from exchanges. And then on the other hand of or the other side of that equation, these sort of low levels uh, point to periods in time where more Bitcoin is being withdrawn from exchanges than moving or flowing to exchanges. So generally speaking, although I'm not a, a fan of saying withdrawals equals bullishness, uh, generally speaking, we are seeing uh, more of a push to withdraw Bitcoin to exchanges than move it uh from exchanges that move BTC to exchanges. So it could point to people sort of uh, buying up all of this uh, new sell side pressure and moving these uh, BTC to their own individual wallets because they don't trust centralized exchanges or whatever, right? So this could mean sort of a uh, propensity to buy this dip and to accumulate some BTC into this correction. One other metrics, metric that I like to use to sort of get a sense of whether there's a potential for uh, whether or for, and as far as on-chain data is concerned, whether there's some move to buy the dip is I actually like to see what's going on with stable coins in particular. And uh, what, what's what's sort of the dynamic between Bitcoin's price action and the exchange activity of stable coins in particular. So what I mean by that, I'm going to log the price of Bitcoin here. Uh, let's look at the last six months and I'm going to move to tether and then i'll show you now the exchange inflow of tether so the exchange inflow of tether essentially shows the total amount of this is erc20 tether so the total amount of erc20 tether that is being moved to known exchange wallets and let's take the last year of data so as you can see we are seeing quite a big spike in Tether's exchange inflow. And I think we have seen a similar spike in uh, USDC's exchange inflow as well. Let me just make sure. Yeah, relatively cons uh, considerable uptick in USDC's exchange inflow as well. So what, that, uh, what a few on-chain analysts believe is that when you see these large inflows of stable coins to exchanges, especially when they happen at sort of a local sort of corrections for BTC, like they happen here, 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 several times around several sort of local bottoms in the past. Uh, what that may suggest is a concerted effort of stable coin holders to exchange their stable coins for more volatile cryptocurrencies, right? So the idea is the reason why you would send a bunch of tether to exchanges is potentially to exchange those tether uh, uh tethers for you know bitcoin ethereum basically to buy the dip so it there is some precedent for this uh as you can see several sort of times in the past we have seen a lot of uh tether related exchange inflows coincide with periods of uh you know uh, uh, correction for btc and then local bottoms for btc so it remains to be seen, but this is another chart where I try to figure out whether there's a potential uh, buy side pressure into this dump. So as some weak hands are dumping, whether there are people looking to scoop up those uh, bit Bitcoins at a, at a discount. And it seems like the answer would be yes. Um, so yeah, keep this all with a grain of salt, obviously. Another reason why you could see an uh, inflow, uh, a appreciation of uh, Tether and other uh, stable coins to exchanges is because they're being minted more. Um, but as far as I've seen, and we can confirm, I haven't seen too much Tether being minted recently. Let's see. There has been one here. There we go. So this is the last time that the new Tether has been minted. Recently, we haven't seen too much new ERC-20 Tether being minted. So this is the total supply of Tether staying the same, but we're seeing a big amount of Tether moving to exchanges, right? So generally, it could point to some large stablecoin holders uh, looking to take advantage of this rally. So if you look at the actual numbers, this is about 1.21 billion Tether moving to exchanges. Now, this is just Tether moving to exchanges. Obviously, there's probably some Tether moving out of it. So the net flows are probably lower, but it does seem to suggest that there is maybe um, 
you know, a cohort of users, a cohort of stablecoin holders that may be looking to buy into this dip a little bit. Yeah, all things considered, you know, with Dino talking about both the Bitcoin and Tether exchange inflows, in the case of any crypto moving to exchanges, all things considered, the odds are that this is more likely to preclude a sell-off event. And in the case of Tether or another stablecoin moving, this would be more often likely that funding is being moved to exchanges to purchase crypto, which would be good. That's why we like the inflows on the stablecoin side. And we're a little bit worried anytime we see a large amount of Bitcoin, Ethereum, what have you, move to exchanges. So it's very useful, especially when those two metrics or two different assets are compared in tandem. Uh, you can find a lot of interesting things. And as Dino showed with the, uh, the minting of Tether, uh, the fact that this latest Tether inflow happened well after the last minting, meaning there probably wasn't much correlation there. And that's an even better sign than than a usual inflow spike for Tether. Yeah. So I think uh, I would also like to go over a few sort of social metrics because I think we've got maybe 15 minutes more or something like that, right? So yes, I we have. And, and mm -hmm. I think that was my next question. Uh, you talked about uh, there is a lot of fear in the market. People are selling at a loss. Can we see that in these social metrics too? So great question. So generally, okay, this is where we can see uh, our list of available social metrics. So essentially, like I said, uh, what we do with our, our social data is we scrape data from about 1500 different cryptocurrency related social media channels. And this list of channels is growing. We keep adding new ones as, you know, new ones pop up. But uh, there are several metrics that we've developed uh, using this data. So the most basic metric that we've developed is social volume. So social volume essentially shows the total amount of mentions of a coin um, on crypto social media. So social volume for Bitcoin, for example, you can see that there has been quite an uptick in a, the total chatter or total mentions or messages, including Bitcoin, uh, in mentions of Bitcoin on crypto social media over the last couple of days. So there definitely seems to be more of a concerted attention to Bitcoin relative to days prior, because I think a lot of people before Bitcoin started to correct, uh, a lot of people were too busy uh, looking at, you know, alts, metaverse coins, um, NFTs. Uh, I, I saw a lot of uh, hype around the specific L1, other L1s. Uh, so generally speaking, I think there were competing market narratives. But once Bitcoin starts dumping, uh, a lot of eyes move back to the top coin because at the end of the day a lot of people know that you know not a whole lot of market can deep back from btc so wherever bitcoin goes the, the rest of the market at least in the short term might as well follow uh obviously there are exceptions to this rule but i think it still applies to around like 80 to 90 percent of the coins so generally speaking there is uh there has been an uptick in social mentions of btc but obviously this only tells us that more attention is being uh put on Bitcoin and that there's more people discussing it, it doesn't really tell us what the sentiment of those messages are. So for that, we've developed a machine learning algorithm uh, a couple of years back where we essentially, what we do is we uh, put all of these messages that we collect, about 100,000 messages daily, we put them through a machine learning algorithm that labels them as either positive, negative, or ambivalent right to figure out what is the average sentiment or the average bias of the crypto community towards a particular coin and then the end result is a metric that we called weighted sentiment and you can kind of see where we are right now so generally speaking uh there was actually a pretty significant spike in sentiment right around the right as the the uh, bitcoin started to correct and we've actually seen I, I think i have it prepared here there we go so let me show you why i think this is um so this seems sort of counterintuitive a little bit that there would be a pretty big spike in positivity as bitcoin started to correct but it seems like uh there were a lot of people uh excited about the opportunity to buy the dip uh, and uh, excited about the potential for swift or sort of expecting pretty quick recovery. So this chart shows the, uh, this is social trends. It's a, um, it's a feature of our platform where you can type in any word or phrase and you can see the total amount of mentions of that word or phrase on crypto social media. So what I've done here is I've looked for mentions of buy and dip or dips. Uh, 
uh, on crypto social media. So any type of mentions of buying the dip or buying dips overall. Um, and then I've plotted, in a, uh, plotted it against the price of Bitcoin. So as you can see, there has been a fairly significant uptick in buy the dip mentions right as Bitcoin started to correct. And this is, by the way, you know, means the first time we see a lot of people talking about buying the dips pretty much any time that uh, Bitcoin actually uh, starts to correct, right? Um, so generally speaking, it's not a surprise to see a pretty uh, significant uptick in sentiment. Uh, is it a good sign for Bitcoin? I don't think it is. Um, so I'm actually quite... Uh, pleased to see Bitcoin related sentiment move back down to earth or reset back to sort of slightly bearish at the time of this recording of this video um, over the last like 24 hours. Because based on uh, historical data, based on backtests that we've done, not just for Bitcoin, but a lot of other coins in the past, elevated social mentions and elevated social sentiment or increasingly bullish sentiment is more often than not not a great sign for a coin obviously there is no silver there are no silver bullets so uh, you know everything depends on market wide conditions but extremely high euphoria even while a coin is dumping suggests that people are still irrationally confident about the potential of that coin and there's still some market pain that needs to be applied before we sort of uh, reset back to sort of a neutral or bearish sentiment so it seems like after a bitcoin sort of failed to capture the 60k level and stay above it we are once again sort of seeing um, another drop in uh, total sentiment or, or average sentiment towards BTC over the last like 24 to 36 hours. My hope as uh, somebody that would like to see Bitcoin, you know, pump once again to a new all time high and move back into price discovery. My hope would be that the, this metric remains very, very low. And I would actually hope that it uh, moves back down even further, suggesting that on average, sort of the average sentiment of the crowd is... Uh, becoming predominantly bearish because really we have seen Bitcoin uh, start to pump or start to recover from predominantly bearish atmospheres more often than from predominantly bullish atmospheres or, or predominantly bullish ecosystems. So generally speaking, immediately after the crash, we have seen uh, an uptick in sentiment. Now it's starting to normalize. And if you can see here, uh, like I said, the crowd likes to talk about buying the dip uh, around every single correction for Bitcoin. But usually it takes a while before they're proving right, so to speak, right? So they're usually early with their calls, like they have been here. There has been after the, these calls to buy the dip, there has been sort of another leg down before uh, the crowd was actually proven right. But I mean, not really right because they were already sort of... Uh, wrong here right and then we've seen uh, several sort of calls of buying the dip here it wasn't until nobody really almost uh, nobody's uh, talked about buying the dip that we were able to start recovering and then back in september uh, there were a lot of calls to buy the dip on september 7th and then it, there was another leg down before we were finally able to uh, to recover uh, once nobody really talked about dip buying anymore so generally speaking this is another sort of um uh, another element that we try to to look into is is there a whole lot of hope uh, or, or hopium in the crypto community about a particular coin if there is we might want to chill a little bit more and wait for that hopium to dissipate um for the market to inflict enough pain to its uh, users where they no longer believe uh, and that's usually where if the fundamentals are still good that's usually where it can be a more uh, or sort of less risky time to enter into a coin, right? Do you know, maybe so, you could also click the uh, term short really quick so we can show just the opposite impact of this. Uh, so what, what Dino showed here with buy the dip is, of course, um, an indication that people are, uh, you know, getting that hopium in large masses. This would be the opposing uh, aspect of that, where you're seeing people saying that it's time to short, You'll often see these spikes arise just as the price is starting to recover. So that's when people are saying, OK, um, this dip happened and now we're seeing a, a recovery that probably isn't real. And that's when people typically want to short. And you'll notice on these big spikes outside of, of course, the biggest one in late June, where the price did continue downwards. Most of them, when people started to um, denounce that it's time to short in large masses, uh, the price surged and went up, just as we see that when people believe it's time to buy the dip, there might be a very small spike up before it goes further down. The opposite is true, where there's a small spike down to agree with the shorters, followed by a big 
surge upwards in price to kind of liquidate those shorts, assuming these are actual real shorts that people are talking about. Um, and I, I think both of these are equally valuable. So if you're checking that social trends page, look at both buy the dip and short on a regular basis, and you'll see some very interesting patterns that kind of prove that the markets really do move in the path of least expectation from the crowd. So uh, I think when we're talking about shorts and generally sort of the um, ratio of longs versus shorts, uh, I should mention that we also have a lot of derivatives data on our platform. We're adding more exchanges as we speak, but we currently have sort of funding rates or we cover funding rates from BitMEX, Binance and FTX, uh, more exchanges to come. But essentially we are sort of seeing the same thing that we are seeing with the uh, Bitcoin related sentiment. So funding rates for people that are not familiar are fees. Uh, it's a fee paid by one side of the perpetual contract to the other, right? So when funding rates are high, that means that the longs are paying Bitcoin, Bitcoin longs are paying Bitcoin shorts. And on average, the market is bullish. And then when funding rates are low, it means that uh, like here, it means that Bitcoin shorts are paying Bitcoin longs and the, the general sort of sentiment in the derivatives market is bearish. So similar to social sentiment, we have seen also these funding rates start to reset over the last sort of 24 to 36 hours, which I also think is a potentially good sign, right? Because uh, they are they have been relatively high uh, over the last couple of weeks. Let me show you. This is Binance, for instance. They have been certainly uh, starting to grow with Bitcoin's all-time high push, suggesting that more and more people were uh, looking to go, you know, lev long. Um, and you know, it was a it was definitely time for these metrics to reset for us to flush some of these over leveraged longs. I think there were about 800 million li long liquidations in the first 24 hours of the correction. All painful, but all necessary. Right. So funding rates similar to social sentiment have been quite high for uh, a minute there. And now they're starting to normalize. They're still not sort of in these negative zones where I would prefer them to be, suggesting that a lot of people were not just sort of undecided about the market where they seem to be right now, but are actively rooting against the market. Um, this is where I think it can be an opportune time to consider a, a, a position, uh, depending on other uh, indicators as well. But yeah, similar to social sentiment and sentiment metrics, or the derivative side of, of things is show, showing the same patterns. It's showing sort of the, uh, the decline in market-related euphoria in movement into more of an undecided territory. There is another level to that, which is from moving from undecided to predominantly or sort of uh, agreeably bearish. We're not there yet, uh, but at least we seem to be moving in that right direction. Okay, that's that's awesome. Um, because I think, you know, to summarize this a little bit, uh, there was a, a good reason for a drop. Looking at all these indicators, yes. the market was overheated. Uh, we're now at a point where, of course, we could see lower. We starting, we are starting to see some signs this is resetting and people are maybe even trying to short the bottom uh, because of the sentiment. I thought it was really funny that when we talked about um, with that, that shorting indicator, people were calling in the chats for 55K and 53K. Well, it's go. exactly that sentiment um, we're, we're measuring here in, on the platform. Um, so I, I think that the general conclusion is, is let, let's see for the next few days if it's, you know, these indicators go maybe even more negative. Um, but I think we can conclude like we're close to may, maybe probably close to a bottom, but we need to see these indicators holding up and, you know, not doing anything super weird. Um, so, yeah, I would say uh, we're definitely sort of uh, we have been overvalued in terms of a number of different indicators. And now now they are being sort of reset. But I don't think like currently I don't think they're uh, completely back to where I would like them to be. And just keep in mind, we haven't talked about a few other indicators that are interesting, like whales, which are now finally starting to accumulate, it seems like. Uh, so uh, whales or large addresses have actually been dumping for a while, for a couple of weeks before this correction even started. So now all of a sudden we're sort of starting to see an, a slight, very slight uptick in the amount of Bitcoin hold, held by these large addresses. And there are a few other metrics that uh, need to dump a little bit more before I can say, okay, we're clearly sort of in the undervalued range. If you want more info on that, just go to app.sentiment.net 
and go to insights. So yesterday I wrote a, or actually this is two days ago, I wrote a, a weekly report. We write this one each day, each week, where we cover Bitcoin from a variety of metrics. So I talked about some of the metrics that we mentioned today, but we also here mentioned a lot of additional uh, in, uh, direct uh, sort of indicators of success for Bitcoin that you might want to keep an eye on. So check this out for more info on where we think Bitcoin is right now. Yeah, and I think there is like a good last question in the chat. Um, will there be a tutorial on how to use these metrics? Well, of course, you can read this blog to get a better understanding and a professional analysis with that. And I think yeah. you all also have a nice academy, right? That shows what you're looking at uh, if you're using some of these metrics. Yeah, so uh, on-chain analysis, social analysis, it's new. Uh, and it can be a little bit overwhelming. I know that, you know, people, when they really start just getting into it, uh, it can be like, what the hell am I looking at? Uh, where do I start? Everybody feels this way. No need to worry. Uh, usually after a couple of weeks, things really start clicking for you. So you just need to stick, stick with it. There are a few ways that you can, uh, sort of uh, amp up or sort of speed up that process. Number one, like I said, read our insights every day. Somebody from the team will write about a market event uh, from the perspective of our metrics to kind of give you a sense of how we read the market using these metrics to give you a sense of what you should uh, focus on. And then every Friday uh, at 4 p.m. Central Eastern time, so that's basically at this moment, just tomorrow, uh, on our YouTube channel, we do a hour long weekly live stream where we talk about bitcoin ethereum and then we take audience questions from different about different assets that they would like us to analyze live on stream so go to youtube and type in sentiment subscribe to the channel so you do, that you get a notification every friday we go live and sort of just answer audience questions about where the market is headed and then lastly our pro plus members that are uh, by uh, a plus a pro plus subscription to sandbase they also get personalized tutorials from uh people from the sentiment team uh every two weeks so we get on a call with a particular user and just sort of try to uh to explain specifically uh, which metrics we find the most useful as well as what metrics they might want us to add to the platform and so on and so forth. So there are definitely ways we're definitely trying to provide as much education as possible because we're aware that this is new. It's a new field of analysis and it takes a while to get into it. But once you get into it, I really think it's a, a very valuable addition to the way that you analyze the markets. I totally agree. These are very valuable insights in what the, what the big players are doing and can be a good addition to your normal like technical analysis if you're a trader, but also gives you a broader perspective if you're an investor. Um, thank you for joining us on this webinar. We had uh, Brian and Dino from Sentiment here. Uh, check out their YouTube, check out their Twitter because they're also active on Twitter. Um, and I think that wraps up the webinar. Thank you guys for joining. And I'll see you in the next webinar. It's been a pleasure, Thanks, guys. guys. Yeah.